could change one thing about yourself, what would that be? Being healthier, prettier, wealthier, or maybe being younger. Although at some time during your life, I'm sure you want to be older. Now, one thing that it is shared across different ages and different societies is the urge to be smarter. Now, this is not something that it is limited to our modern time. If you read ancient stories, like stories about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden eating the forbidden fruits in order to gain knowledge, you understand that this idea, this concept, occupied mankind long time before us. Nowadays, scientists try to find innovative ways to improve the brain and cognitive abilities. And one method that I want to share with you today is called transcranial electrical stimulation. Now, in this method, we place electrodes on the scalp of a subject and we aim to deliver low, painless current that will affect brain regions beneath these electrodes and other areas that are connected to that. Now, we aim to improve cognition, and you might think, wait a second, this sounds like science fiction. And if you do, you're not alone. Because seven years ago, I sent a grant application to do this work, and I sent it to the Royal Society, and I didn't even pass the first stage in their application. Basically, I received one line. Excellent candidate. But is this really feasible? Well, luckily enough, the Wellcome Trust funded this project, and I would like to share with you some of the advancements that we made. But before showing you that, a very important question is how can we really assess that someone is knowledgeable? How can we know that someone is really an expert? And for that, cognitive psychologists design really nice paradigm in order to assess that. And one paradigm that shows us whether you are an expert or not with numbers is a paradigm that's been developed by Avishai Hanik and Yossi Tselgov 30 years ago in Israel, and I was lucky enough to work with them. Not 30 years ago, I'm younger for that. And I want you actually to try that, okay? So I'm going to show you two digits on the screen. One on the left side and one on the right side. And what I want you is to compare those digits for their physical size. Which one is physically larger? If it's the one on the left side, I want you to raise your left hand. If it's the one on the right side, I want you to left to raise your right hand. And I want you to do it as fast as possible and ignore the numerical value. Okay? Are you ready? So, just put your hands like that. You need to do it as fast as possible with no brain stimulation. Ready? Steady? Go! Okay. Great. You all felt it, right? I ask you not to process the numerical information. And what you did? Your brain did it for you. 
it just processed it. It affected your decision. Because you are all experts with numbers. You've been bombarded with numbers since even before school and you process it every day of your life. So you don't even need to do that. It just been done automatically. And this is a measure of how expert you are. When you're an expert, things will happen without you putting a lot of effort in that. Now, when we run these experiments in a control lab environment and recording reaction times of the subjects to the precision of a millisecond, we can then assess how expert they are with numbers, with the same paradigm that I showed you. And what you could see on the graph is that adults, university students, are quite experts in that. They show really a pattern that reflects that numbers confuse them. They don't do this task as well. Now, children at the age of eight years old will do this task much better because numbers will not interfere to them as much. They're still not as expert. It still doesn't affect their decisions. Now, if we take in adults, university students, but they have dyscalculia, which is the equivalent to dyslexia, just with numbers, you find out that their performance is at the level of eight years old children. They're not good with numbers. Now, they're not stupid. Some of them really bright in the topics that they study, but it doesn't involve any numerical information. Now, what we did, we repeat this experiment with healthy adults, young adults, and give them artificial numbers that we created, symbols that they never saw before. And we trained them for six days on those artificial numbers and want to see now how expert they become with these numbers. Give them the same task and assess that. Now, to one group, we did not stimulate their brain. They received placebo stimulation. And you could see how they perform after six days. This is at the level of children. Well, it is only six days. What can we expect? But now we repeat this experiment and stimulated the brain regions that are involved in numerical processing in these young adults and want to see now what will happen. And when we did stimulate, this is what we observed. Magnificent. We found an increase in their performance. They perform now more like an expert. It's still not at the level that they do that with everyday digits. But on the other hand, we're talking about only six days of training. This is nothing. Now, these results are fascinating, but they raise another question. Is it long-lasting? If we now send the subjects home, and we ask them to come back after a few days, we do really see that they are still outperformed those who did not receive stimulation, because otherwise it's not going to be as attractive or as important. So we run another experiment. We now give the subject to perform arithmetics, and we train them on that. So we gave them an algorithm that you could see here, which is the first operand plus the second operand minus 10 plus second operand of two digits that they see on the screen, and they need to put their answer. It was five days of training. Again, one group received placebo, one group received real stimulation. And here is, for example, two numbers that appears there. Could you give me the answer? What would be the answer? You could see it's hard, right? <laughs> okay, it is 31. Um, but, although they outperform when they receive stimulation compared to the placebo, we send them home and we call them to come back after six months. We call them, we ask them to come, and we get them to do the same task. And what that we found is that those who receive stimulation still perform better than those who receive placebo stimulation after six months. And this is not limited only to numbers that they 
so two digits that they saw during their training six months before, but now if we give them new information, we find that they perform also on the new information better. So it's basically been generalized from the training that they received six months before to new information. Now people read a lot of time about our experiments and findings and experiments by other labs in the world that running similar studies and they feel the urge to try that at home because you can read online instructions how to make your own kit and there are online companies that sell that and we want to see another question does everyone going to benefit from that or there are going to be some that will and some that will not most of our experiments are on university students it doesn't mean that it's going to be translated to others so we run an experiment on people with maths anxiety maths anxiety is the phenomenon that someone needs to solve or to engage with numerical information and they get anxious and they try to avoid that. It's not for them, it's not something fun to try to do any mental calculation, for example. It's actually quite bad for them to do something like that. So if you're going to a restaurant with someone and they bring the bill and this person says, I'm not good with maths, why won't you do that? There are two choices. They might have maths anxiety or they just might be cheap. Now I can see how some people are going to be in a restaurant and give this excuse, sorry, I have much anxiety, why won't you do that? But anyway, we gave them to solve arithmetic problems to people with high math anxiety and we stimulated regions that are involved in emotion regulation and valence. And what that we found is that when they receive stimulation, compared when they receive placebo stimulation, they perform faster the arithmetic problems. So we improve their performance to do that. But critically, we also assess what happened if we give to another population the same stimulation, the same task, but they do not have maths anxiety. These people with low maths anxiety. And we found exactly the opposite. So people who do not need it, but maybe want to stimulate themselves to further improve their arithmetic performance, going to show impairment. They're not going to benefit. They are better in a natural way. I told you so far some of the things that we do know. Let me share with you some of the things that we do not know. So first of all, most of the experiments are done in a controlled lab environment. This is an artificial environment. It doesn't mean that it will be necessarily been translated to the outside world, to real life event. And this is something that we really need to go and start to examine if you're really thinking about it, not only as a tool to further our understanding of the human brain, but also something that can help society. The other point is a more neuroethical question. Who should use it? If you really can improve cognition, who should benefit from that? Those who have lower cognitive abilities, average cognitive abilities, exceptional co cognitive abilities to advance it even further, children, young adults, elderly, armed forces. And the last thing, are there any free lunches? Free lunches might not be the best words because Adam and Eve had free lunches and they gave up in order to get the enhancement. So are there free enhancements? If we enhance our abilities, are we going to affect other cognitive abilities to impair them? in return, and we need to have a better understanding of the benefit and cost of using this technology. 
I hope that I stimulated you with my talk. But one of the things I do not want you to do is to stimulate your brain at home using this method. There is still more knowledge that we need to gain if and before we can use it to create a better, stronger, and smarter society. Thank you.